Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Tuesday, December 14th, we were working the day watch out of Bunko Division. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss is Captain Steve. My name's Friday. A gang of petty swindlers had set up operations in the city. We knew they were experienced, we knew they were cunning. They worked fast. We had to stop them. Joe? Yeah? It's Miss Bergstrom. You spoke to her on the phone last night? Oh, yeah, sure. It's my partner, Sergeant Friday, miss. How do you do? Glad to know you. These are the things you told me about, are they? Yes, here they are. Sure make them look nice, don't they? Yeah. Let me take the back off the watch for you. You can see for yourself, Sergeant. It's just junk. Nothing inside. Doesn't look like it's worth 15 cents. He charged me $48 for that watch. He said it was wholesale. He wasn't making any profit on it. He told me he was doing it because he'd known Harry so well. Nothing inside. Just an empty case. Well, how about the pen and pencil set, miss? Just as bad. The pen's just a shell. Won't even write. Same with the pencil. I paid him $30 for them. Mm-hmm. This engraving on the pen with love from Harry? That's Harry, the boy I was engaged to. That's how the man got me interested to start with. He came to my house and gave them to me. The watch and the pen and pencil. He said Harry had ordered them as presents for me. I see. I just had to cry when he brought them. Poor Harry. When did this man come to your home, Miss Bergstrom? Yesterday morning. I guess I should have been more careful, but I didn't think anybody would do a thing like that. What kind of a story did he give you? Well, he came to the door and told me his name was Spencer. He said Harry had ordered these things as presents for me, and that Harry had told him to deliver them to my house. The watch looked beautiful in the case. I didn't know anything was wrong. I see. Would you go on, please? He told me it was a special order. He said Harry had written him from overseas the week before. Well, he said he hoped the engraving was all right. The way Harry wrote, he wanted it in his letter. I just couldn't take it. I cried. This man, he pretended to be a close friend of Harry's, huh? Yes, that's why I showed him the letter. The one Harry's folks got from the government about him being killed overseas. When did you receive that letter, Miss Bergstrom? Two days before, on Saturday. Harry's name was in the obituaries on Monday. Mm -hmm. What'd the man do when you showed him the letter? He sympathized with me. Or he pretended to. I didn't think there was any trick. I didn't know anybody was that low. The pen and pencil set looked a little cheap, but I wanted to keep them no matter how cheap they were. Harry's last present to me. That's what I thought. How'd he bring up the idea of money, miss? Well, when he was ready to leave, he told me that Harry had ordered the things on credit. He said he didn't want to mention it, but he wondered how he could get payment for the watch and the pen and pencil. He didn't show you a bill, did he? An invoice listing the price of the watch or the engraving that was done? No, and I didn't want him bothering Harry's mother and father at a time like this. So I borrowed some money from my dad and paid him. $48 for the watch, 30 for the pen and pencil set. Could you describe the man for us, Miss Bergstrom, what he looked like, clothes he was wearing? It's right here on this slip of paper. It's all written out for you. Thank you. It's a terrible thing, coming right at the time of Harry's death. Well, you're not alone, if that's any consolation. An army widow out in Hollywood was cheated on the same kind of deal last Friday. It's so cruel. Using a dead person's name to cheat you. Yes, ma'am. How could anyone get lower than that? They keep trying. Frank and I took Miss Bergstrom's crime report. The phony watch and pen and pencil set were booked as evidence. In the past two weeks, we've received half a dozen identical complaints from relatives or friends of lately deceased persons. The swindler, or con man, as he likes to be called in his trade, gets the names of lately deceased persons from the obituary column or the military casualty list in the daily newspapers. He then fixes up some cheap article of merchandise with appropriate engraving and calls on the friends and relatives of the deceased. He pretends to know nothing about the death of the person who he claims placed the order for the merchandise. In almost every case, the friend or relative agrees to pay for the articles at some exorbitant price. For the con man, it's a lucrative racket. For the public, a vicious one. Wednesday, December 15th, Frank and I looked up one of our informants, a former con man by the name of Judd Scanlon. 
What do you think of it, fellas? Been in business two months now, doing fine. What do you think of it? Looks great, Judd. Nice setup. Finest baby laundry in South Los Angeles. That's what I advertise. I don't think it's too broad, do you? We'd like to know how close you got your ear to the ground, Judd. There's a gang of bunks in town. They're working hard. What pitch are you using? They're working the obituary columns, casualty lists. Thought you might be able to help us. That's one thing they can never tear me for. Obituary racket. Lousiest racket there is. Can you do anything for us? Heard one little rumble about it. Four or five boys in the con mob, that right? We know that, Judd. Where can we look for them? Well, as I say, when I quit the game, I quit. Oh, maybe I could take a few soundings for you. Can't promise you anything. I'm strictly on the up and up now. Okay, Judd. You know where to get in touch with us. We'd appreciate anything you can do. You've helped me plenty of time, fellas. Wouldn't hurt a bit to tab that bunch. Yeah, look at this. You ever seen anything so cute in your life? Real cute, huh? That's all right. Say, Judd, could I use your phone a minute? Oh, sure. Thank you. Might as well check the office while we're here. Two five seven two, please. Yes, that's right. Bunko Division. Thank you. Hi, Devetta. This is Joe Friday. Yeah. Anything doing? Uh huh. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And what's the name? Uh huh. I see. Yeah. You bet, John. Right. Yeah. We'll check it. Right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Anything? Yeah. We might have a lead on him. What is it? Reached a woman up in Highland Park, a Mrs. Westerly. Daughter was killed in an auto accident. Last night they came around and sold a woman a watch her daughter was supposed to have ordered. A necklace and a pen and pencil set, too. 250 bucks, usual junk. Uh-huh. They talked to this Mrs. Westerly? Yeah, I got a description. Everything matches all along the line. Yeah, well, what's the lead? Well, this Mrs. Westerly watched the man when he left her house. Yeah. He got in a taxi cab. <laughs> a.m. While Sergeants Bryant and Ullery got out a broadcast on the suspect, Frank and I drove to the offices of the taxi cab company where we contacted the special agent. He helped us check the waybills for the preceding night. On the waybill for cab 213, we found the trip listed. Starting point, the intersection nearest the Westerly home. Destination, a hotel on South Flower Street. We went to the hotel and interviewed the desk clerk. From the description we gave him, he identified the man as Fred G. Norris from Minneapolis. At least that's the way he'd signed the hotel register. The clerk told us that Norris wasn't in. We had him show us his room. In his suitcases, we found quantities of dime store costume jewelry, monogrammed, two dozen cheap wristwatches and wallets and handbags done in poor quality imitation leather, also a portable engraving set. The clerk told us Norris was expected back shortly. We told him to say nothing to the suspect when he arrived. We waited in the room. We called the office to let them know where we were. 1 p.m. Still no sign of Norris. Let it ring. Think it's Norris? Could be. Call him to see if the room's clear. Yeah. Persistent, huh? No. Guess they gave up. I'll check to see who it was. call was for us, was it? No, this is 214. You just let us in a little while ago, remember? Yeah, that's right. This is Sergeant Friday. You remember you had the pass key? You... That's right, yeah. Well, who was that call? Yeah, fine. No, you did exactly right. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'll tell you why we didn't answer it on our way out, huh? All right. Fine. Yeah. Fine. Norris? No, it was the office. Yeah. They just picked up Norris. p.m. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout at the hotel in case any of Norris's pals attempted to contact him. Then we drove back to the office. They told us Norris had been recognized from his description and picked up by Unit 1R7 on the way back to his hotel shortly before noon. Frank and I joined Sergeants Ullery and Bryant in the squad room where they'd been questioning the suspect. He looked about 40 years old, white male American, about 5 foot 8 inches tall, 160 pounds. He would admit nothing. You're wasting our time on your own, Norris. Face it. You were playing a rough game and you lost. Now, how about it? You're gonna feel pretty silly when you find out you got the wrong guy. We got witnesses and evidence that say you're the right guy. You've got no evidence on me. I'm clean. Who do you work for, Fred? Company in the East. You wouldn't know them. You must have a business card, some kind of identification from the company. Well, I haven't. They don't give us any. You expect us to swallow that? I don't expect you to swallow anything. You can do what you want about investigating me. If you haven't a thing to hold me on, why not just stick me up and let's get it over with? <laughs> 
Now, let's stop kidding, Fred. You've been in the con game so long, you can't talk straight even when you want to. I got two suitcases of goods in my hotel room. If you think you can make me on that, you can go ahead. We got more than that, Norris. We got the people you swindled. They'll tab you. How about it? You want to do it the hard way? Joe? There's no use wasting any more time with them. You got that list of victims? Yeah. The ones with the check marks are the ones that tab Norris. Thanks. Miss Bergstrom there, please. This is Sergeant Friday, Miss Bergstrom, Bunko Division. Yes, we picked up a suspect. We'd like to see if you can identify him. Yes, that's right. Would it be all right if we sent a car out for you now? All right, fine. Fine. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Westerly? Ms. Westerly, this is Sergeant Friday, Bunko Division. Yes, ma'am, that's right. Yes. We've got a suspect down here. We'd like to see if you can identify him. Could you come down if we sent a car out for you? Fine. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Goodbye. Mr. Hanson? No, that's all right. I'll hang on. This is the Los Angeles Police Department. I can't sit here all day. Quiet. He's on the phone. Hello, Mr. Hanson. Well, this is Sergeant Friday, Bunko Division. Yes, sir, that's right. Police Department. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. Say, Mr. Hanson, we have a suspect in custody down here. No, I say we have a suspect in custody down here. Wondering if you could come down to identify him. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that watch deal. Yes, sir. Could you make it down here if we sent a car out for you right away? Good. Fine. Thank you very much, sir. Right, we'll see you then. Right. Hello. Hello, is Miss Cronin there, please? Well, this is Sergeant Friday calling, Miss Cronin. Bunko Division? That's right, Los Angeles Police Department. Sorry to disturb you, but we have a suspect in custody down here. Yeah. Hey, Sergeant. Yes, ma'am, that's right. Sergeant. Uh -huh. Would you hold on a minute, please? Put down the phone. Yeah. You got me. Two fifty eight PM. We informed the victims that the special show up had been canceled. Then we called in a stenographer and had her take Fred Norris's statement. In addition to listing the crimes he committed, he also told us there were six men in the Bunko gang besides himself. He gave us the names and descriptions of each one of them. He stated that they'd been operating in Los Angeles for the past four months. Norris said none of them had ever met the leader of the Bunko gang. The only contact they had with the leader was through one of the older gang members, a man by the name of Wesley Fisher. Before Norris was taken to the main jail for booking, he gave us the address of the apartment where he had been living with the other gang members. Norris's information on the suspects was checked through R&I. We got one make, Wesley Fisher. He had one prior arrest two years before on a grand theft charge, but had been released for lack of evidence. 3.15 p.m. Together with Sergeants Ullery and Bryant and two men from Metro Squad, we drove out to the address given us by Fred Norris. It was a large apartment development in the Hollywood area. Well, Bryant and Ullery ought to be around back by now. Yeah, they've had plenty of time. I'll try it again. Did you want to see the people that live there? Yes, ma'am. Did you want to check the garbage disposal? I've got a key. I'm Mrs. Callahan, the manager. No, ma'am. We want to talk to the tenants. I'm afraid you're a little late. What? They just moved out, bag and baggage. Wednesday, December 15th, 4 p.m. We made a thorough check of the apartment house, which the six suspects had just vacated. We found nothing that would help us. We talked to the manager of the building where the suspects had been living. She told us that they had rented the place furnished about three months before. She identified Wesley Fisher's mugshot, but she told us that he had used the name of Charles Wilder. She also identified each of the other gang members from the descriptions Fred Norris had given us. She told us that while they were living there, the men seemed to keep odd hours and that they had a car. She told us that she had taken the license number of the car the day the men moved in. 
The license number was checked with DMV. It was registered in the name of Wesley Fisher, 1008 California Street, a transient hotel. The manager told us Fisher had moved about nine months before. There was no forwarding address. We got out an all-points bulletin on Wesley Fisher and his automobile, requesting that all occupants of the car be held for investigation of grand theft. Thursday, December 16th, 8 a.m. Frank and I checked into the office. Well, from what Norris said, we know they brought most of the junk they're selling with them from the Middle West. Yeah, it looks like they were using that hotel room Norris had for a warehouse. I guess they didn't want to keep this stuff in the place where they were living. You figure there's any way we can set up stakeouts? No, not unless we cover every name in the obituary column. The way it's going, we might have to try it. We've got to come up with something. Look at these. Two more this morning. Straight out of the obituary column. Yeah, they took one family for $90. The other one here for 60 that last run through the stats office help any? We've got a couple of possibles for us. They pulled some more mugs for us. Gonna show them to the victims this morning. What do you think about Norris? You think he's come up with everything? I don't know, Joe. Bryant and Ollery talked to him yesterday at the main jail. He didn't have anything new. Mm -hmm. I talked to the sheriff's bunco detail. They got one new case. Same M.O. Description comes close to one of the guys. The victim was the father of a Navy flyer lost overseas. They sold him a watch chain his son was supposed to have bought him for a present. Solid brass. I got anything new on it? Well, they haven't been able to come up with anything either. I got it. Bronco Division, Friday. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Judd. Uh-huh. Yeah, we can be there. Yeah, you bet. Be right there. Judd Scanlon? Yeah. He wants to know if the name Wesley Fisher means anything to us. Well, I don't know what it's worth, but my brother Max called me up this morning. Remember Max, don't you? No, I don't think so. Well, he's a night bartender at the Parrot, you know, and last night he spotted a couple of guys at the bar. They had a couple of day-old newspapers. Uh-huh. They were sitting there with the papers turned in the obituary column. They were checking off names and writing down addresses. Max is sharp that way. He spotted them right off. Does Max know these two men he spotted? No, not by name. But he knew that one of them lived in the hotel next door to the bar. When the hotel night clerk came in for a beer, Max asked him about it. He tagged one of the guys as Wesley Fisher. Did he have anything on the other man? No, the clerk told Max he doesn't live at the hotel. But he spends a lot of time there with Fisher. Uh-huh. Could you give us your brother's home address, Judd? We don't want to contact him at that bar. Sure thing. He just moved. Oh, I see. I don't know. Hope I didn't get you guys out here for nothing. Appreciate it, Judd. It looks good. Seems to fit. That hotel down there. It's a hangout for con men. The angles are all there. Let's hope Fisher is. 8.53 a.m. We arrived at the hotel on South Main Street. We checked with the desk clerk who told us that Wesley Fisher had room 37. As far as he knew, Fisher was in his room. We got a pass key from the clerk, went up to room 37 where we found Fisher and another man. He identified himself as Raymond Wilson, one of the gang members identified by Fred Norris. We also found a small supply of cheap watches and pen and pencil sets. We found Fisher's car. It was impounded. We took both suspects back to the city hall. We questioned them separately in the squad room. Wilson was first, but he refused to answer our questions. He was taken outside, and Wesley Fisher was brought in. Sit down, Fisher. Thank you. Well, I guess you know why you're here. I have the least idea. All right, then, we'll tell you. Do you know a Fred Norris? Fred Norris? Name sounds a little familiar. Can't quite place it. He places you pretty well. He says he worked with you and Wilson up until a couple of days ago. That's so? That's right. He says he lived with you in that apartment out in Hollywood. That's so. Norris, Hollywood. When was that? Two days ago, Fisher. Your landlady identified your mug. She even had the license number of your car. Well, what's it prove, gentlemen? It proves you're lying. You and Wilson worked together. You did work with Norris. You're part of one of the filthiest rackets going. Gentlemen, you're making a bad mistake. Now, there's no mistake, Fisher. Your picture's been identified by at least a half a dozen victims. Now, you can go on playing coy all you want, but we can prove that the pen and pencil sets you sold some of the victims are identical with the ones we found in your car and the ones we got in your room. I haven't any idea what you're talking about. Believe me, that's the truth. You wouldn't know the truth if it followed you, mister. Now, you look. Maybe you're great at conning old men and young girls, but don't try to pass any of it here. Now, just a minute, please. No, you listen, you two-bit thief. I couldn't begin to tell you off for the rotten things you've been pulling off in this town for the past three months. That young girl who lost her boyfriend overseas, that widow out in Hollywood, the old man in Highland Park whose wife passed away. You must have felt real sharp cheating them out of a few bucks. Maybe you don't remember, but we do and they do, and you're going to pay for them, mister. You're going to pay good. Are you all through? I'm through, Fisher. You're just beginning. I have nothing further to say, gentlemen. You can talk to my lawyer. Yeah, we'll give him your new address. Yes? Main jail. <laughs>
Suspects Wesley Fisher and Raymond Wilson were booked and transported to the main jail. Both of them were positively identified by the victims. Warrants were obtained for the three suspects, Norris, Fisher, and Wilson. They were arraigned and held to answer at the preliminary hearing on several counts of grand theft. During the next two weeks and through the Christmas holidays, identical complaints of bunco operations continued to come in. Friends and relatives of lately deceased persons were still being victimized. The gang's operations continued as usual. There was only one change. The crime report showed that a woman was now operating in the obituary racket, along with the male suspects. Christmas came and went. On New Year's Eve, Frank and I were assigned to standby duty. A few minutes before 8 p.m., we got a call from the main jail that Wesley Fisher wanted to see us. We went to the second floor of the main jail, the interview room. All right, what's on your mind, Fisher? A lot. I'm getting a dirty deal. I'm going to do something about it. Well, what's the trouble? I was supposed to be bailed out. She promised me. I was supposed to have a lawyer. I had the public defender. Who's she? I'm not going to take all the heat. They're in just as deep as I am. If they can't do right by me, I'll square it up myself. I'll tell you everything I know. Go ahead. What is it? Her name's Betty McGraw. She's the one you've been looking for. She planned it out. The whole idea was hers. She got everybody together. It was her show. Where will we find her? 213 Foster, apartment 8. Wesley Fisher gave us a complete statement of all of his crimes and also implicated the other members. He told us Betty McGraw was his girlfriend. She'd come up with the idea for the obituary racket. She gathered the men together for the job, and it had been planned that she was to stay in the background. In case of trouble, she would furnish aid to the gang members in the form of bail bond money and lawyers. She received a percentage of the take from each of the gang members. We checked her through R&I and found that she had a record. We checked out the address on the package and found that she'd gone to a New Year's Eve celebration at a downtown hotel. It was 11.57 when we got to the hotel. We identified ourselves to the special officer and showed him the mugshot of Betty McGraw. He thought he'd seen her at the bar. We started looking. Betty McGraw. What do you want with her? <laughs> All right, now, come on, lady, sober up. Is your name Betty McGraw? Yeah, I'm Betty McGraw, but I don't know you. Who are you, anyway? Police officers. We'd like to talk to you outside. Outside? I'm staying in here. This is where the party is, right here. All right, come on, lady, outside. Is there a bar outside? I didn't know there was a bar outside. Come on, lady, let's go. I don't know you at all. I'm not going. I'm not going with you. This is New Year's Eve, don't you know that? New Year's Eve, and it's almost 12 o'clock. trying to get through all this. Yeah, we'll have to wait. Hey. Yeah? What's the matter? I don't know why, but I always cry on New Year's Eve. No reason. I just cry. Yeah? Every year, New Year's Eve, midnight comes, I cry. I had no reason for it. Is that right? I cry. I just cry. Never did have any reason for it. You're gonna have one this year, lady. March 28th, trial was held in Department 93, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted on 14 counts of grand theft. The remaining members of the Bunko Gang were apprehended, tried, and convicted on the same charges and received like sentences. Grand theft is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than one, nor more than ten years.